Okay, and we're rolling. Martin McPhillamy, thank you so much for joining the show today. No problem. Thanks for, for, for having me on today. Absolute pleasure. Martin, you're a sleep and a breath specialist who helps people improve their mental and physical performance through their health. And your brand is called Performance Through Health, so I, I absolutely love that. So, in your own words, what is performance through health? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Um, I guess the concept came from looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, really, and going that if, as an individual, if you want to self-actualize and you want to you know, be the best that you can be, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean like you have to be a professional athlete or anything like that, but just choosing your what you're good at, what you love, um, and striving towards that every day. To get to that point, we need to meet our basic needs first, and those basic needs are our, our safety needs and our physiological needs. And in the world that we're in today, uh, having spent 10 years in, in uh, healthcare, both in public and private, I just recognize that people weren't putting things like sleep, uh, stress management, even breathing issues, uh, and nutrition and exercise first, and they were expecting themselves to be able to you know, have a, a long career, a successful career, or reach their business goals. And then by the time they hit their 45, 50 years old, they were, they were having to drop that because they were having medical conditions that were such as chronic health issues. So I just thought the idea is that to be able to perform at your best, you've got to come through health first. You've got to have health as a basic need first fulfilled before you can self-actualize and reach your best. 100%. I absolutely love that. And it's funny that, you know, in athletics, if you're an elite level performer, athlete, athletes know that, you know, you have to be an athlete 100% of the time. You're not going to be able to stay at the top if you're just an athlete, you know, a couple hours a day or, you know, one, one or two days a week. But you have to be an athlete 100% of the time to be able to support that kind of performance. And it's sure. the same thing in the corporate world. Like if you're someone who has a very mentally challenging and a stressful job, in, in, in a way you are an athlete and because you're doing something that the human body hasn't evolved to do. You know, like we haven't evolved to be on calls and meetings and have a million things on our plate all the time. So in a kind of the same way, like you kind of have to approach that as being like a quote-unquote corporate athlete almost. Oh, for sure. I think um, you know, af athletes, to me, there's there's a there's a part of it that necessarily, once you go through the health aspect, it becomes unhealthy because it becomes such of a. You know, how many athletes are, are there out there who are at the peak of their game, who actually probably in terms of their health is probably deteriorating because they become so obsessed about it, and this is where I think uh, you know, a, a new a new vision of performance that uh, that I'm trying to look at as well as, as well as a few other people is, is that the now the athletes need to look at their well-being as well as their, their, their ability to perform and not so get much tied in with their identity on, on, on winning and achieving, but more so, like, okay, well, who are you as an individual and what values do you take? And I think it's the same in the corporate world because I've seen so much cognitive dissonance between the people's values and people's actions. So, for example, you might have a father who runs a a business, a massive corporate business, and believes that to be a successful father, he has to earn a lot of money, but also wants to spend a lot of time with his children. Like, how that, those, those two things don't align up. And you see that kind of, that leads to issues with stress. And that's where my concept of, like, stress management is looking at not just at how do you manage it physiologically, but in terms of how do you manage it in terms of your belief systems and who you are and your values and your structures in your life and the way you're living your life. That's, that's also one thing that I look into. And I think athletes are at the same point as well because there's so much expectation on them to be an athlete. As soon as they win and achieve, they just go down the, go downhill and realize it's not all that it turns out to be, to be a, you know, a gold medal winner if you don't have anything after that. that that's exactly right. Yeah, and like in athletics, another example is that you might have someone who's super talented and they get to the top very, very quickly just because of their talents. But then, you know, how long do they actually stay at the top? How long are they able to stay on top of their game? 
versus the guys who you know are able to stay on top of their game and be the best of the best for you know decades like those are the guys who are putting their well-being who are putting their stress management their sleep and all this at a very very high place in their hierarchy yeah so what kind of you know when health is not prioritized what kind of things did you see that people were coming to you and people were presenting themselves with especially in the in the corporate area if we speak about that yeah sure so i mean you're going to see uh, in a range of mental health issues anxiety burnout um, and, and depression they're there at the top of the game in fact in fact people who are high in the corporate world are more likely to suffer from those things than people who who are not uh, just because of their personality type and their need to achieve and the belief systems held around that in terms of that they're mostly driven through fear fear of not being good enough um, and when you when they start to kind of realize that and they hit it you know 40 or 50 and have a midlife crisis it then tends to turn out to it com usually comes out in a chronic health issue so they won't realize that they have a mental health issue until they have something like sleep apnea diabetes or um, you know, mild cardiac arrhythmia or or, 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 a, or, or cardiac ca disease itself and all of a sudden they they they're it's that usually their energy and their focus that used to tends to disappear and tends to go and that's uh, I guess the when they start to realize they've got problems and then they all of a sudden go to a doctor or they turn up on my doorstep and we have a little bit more of a, a holistic chat and it's actually an array of issues that they've got which usually especially in the industry that I was in was either coming from their sleep problem or from a stress problem or from a breathing problem because the, all three of them are interlinked yeah 100% and what, was there any one, tic one particular, you know, very pivotal moment in your in your career that kind of led you down? Like, okay, that it's the sleep and the and the breath. Like, those are the the gateways that give me the best access to being able to help these people. Was there any one thing, or how how did you end up going down those down those avenues? So orig originally, when I uh, did my ma I did a master's of research in exercise physiology. And I did some, um, uh, some some research around inspiratory muscle training and looking at how we can improve recovery from from athletes, uh, recovery utilizing inspiratory muscle training in, in, in high intensity exercise, and uh, also look at inf inflammation and how that happens in the breathing and things. And then I went down the route of being a clinical scientist, and I trained as a specialist in respiratory and sleep because in the medical field those two are tied in together because the link between sleep disorder breathing, obstructive sleep apnea is, is, is basically a respiratory specialist uh, or respiratory doctor's uh, specialism. So those two was more down to the career path that I chose. And then I would say 2016 when I moved from public health, public health to private health and I started seeing more of your people who could afford to pay for private health, you're more, you know, you're more um, rather than the people who are sick sick, they're you may, might call them the worried well not. They don't realize they're sick, but then they come and got an issue. Um, then I realized that just tying things together, that a lot of it was to do with stress. They were coming back with normal results in terms of their lungs were fine or their sleep might have only had a mild problem. But then they had chronic issues in terms of energy, focus, and productivity problems. And it was often due to stress that was causing those issues. So then I started to uh, really trying to tie in the three together um, and that's where I've took the route maybe, I think it was four years ago when I started Performance Through Health and I started specializing in this area um, just because I saw it as a gap. Fantastic. So you s mentioned you know, sleep disorder breathing and obstructive sleep apnea. And could you explain to the listener what exactly, um, what exactly is obstructive sleep apnea? So obstructive sleep apnea is... Um, is essentially where your airways kind of relax too much and collapse in your throat at night time. So say if someone would be normal, they might be breathing normally, then they might start snoring. The snoring is a sign that the airway is starting to flutter and it's got vibrations in there. It means there's some kind of weakness in the structure. And then you, the, the, the airway might occlude. And imagine if you've got an open airway, breathe, breathing normally as you go through, all of a sudden it occludes and you, you, it's like you're choking in your sleep. If that happens, uh, for more than 10 seconds and then for more than five times an hour that's then classed as obstructive sleep apnea 
And what tends to happen is you can't breathe, oxygen levels will fall. Because oxygen levels are full, the stress response system kicks in because of the lack of oxygen. Obviously, when you're sleeping, it's no good to have a bolt of adrenaline go through your body. That causes your, your brain to wake up. You get a marker awakening, and all of a sudden, you go back to sleep again, and that can happen on a pattern. And I've seen it happen like anywhere from five times an hour up to 155 times an hour. And that's just going to cause people to uh, feel rubbish in the morning, uh, just like fall asleep at the wheel. For not be able to focus on their work, like just literally feeling crap, like headaches, migraines, um, uh, diabetes. Like we can go into the, the the chronic stuff if you want, but yeah, it's a, it's a crippling issue that causes severe quality of life impacts. Yeah, the impacts are absolutely crazy, and I have personal experience only from um, five wake ups an hour, and I can tell that that is still like that's not ideal like that's absolutely terrible so i can't even imagine like it's 150 times an hour or like you know what's mm. considered severe anything above 30 times an hour like yeah wow it's yeah, just these people are falling falling asleep in front of me like i'm having a conversation with them when i'm having to you know bang the desk or like you know go up to them and actually give them a nudge on the arm and say hey you realize you just fell asleep like no i never well, no, you did. <laughs> I'm talking to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Martin, do you know? Do you know? Because I know that it varies on the the criteria that's being used for you know what cla what's classified as a as an apnea event. But what mm. percentage of population nowadays um, are suffering from this kind of problems? And are there any particular populations that are at a higher risk than other ones? Uh, yeah, so if we're to to look at overall, I think it's I think it's three percent of females and about seven percent of males. But then if we tie that into Westerners and look at Westerners over the age of forty-five, you're probably looking at about one in four males and one in ten females. And females are typically underdiagnosed just because males will get forced by their partners to go to and get get it sorted because of the snoring. Whereas females will deny snoring because they find it embarrassing, which is, no, it's not an embarrassing thing. It's just a thing that happens to our body. But because uh, I guess it's been labeled as a male, d male issue, uh, snoring usually is a male issue. So you know, if your fema a female wants to be feel feminine, telling them they're, snor they're snoring or that them believing they're snoring can cause, again, <laughs> some kind of uh, further stress. So they would rather not go to the doctors for that sort of thing or admit that sort of thing, whereas a, a man kind of gets the, the elbow and the, the, you know, the wife brings the doctor up and says, Ma, you need to swap my husband out because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not getting sleep. Uh, but typically, typically it's been seen as obese individuals. Obesity has a big impact just because of the weight on the neck um, yeah. and to do with how the weight can actually cause issues with breathing, hyperventilation, and just you know, suppress breathing at night, so you're, you've got more like a chance for your airways to collapse. But then um, you've also got a few kind of ethnic, minority, ethnic groups. So India, uh, New Zealand, China, uh, all very have, have higher prevalence of having obstructive sleep apnea as well. And they believe that's more to do with anatomical structures and structures in the jaw yeah. And if you've read James Nestor's book, Breath, it's probably likely to do with the changes in their diet that are causing the changes in their, uh, the anatomical structures in their jaws as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, myself, the reason why, or the way it's been explained to me by dentists is that my maxilla, which is the top jaw, is underdeveloped compared to the rest of my orofacial complex. So therefore, there is literally less space in my mouth for my tongue. And you know, my, my yeah. tongue is obviously like, it's come stock standard size, you know, from my Finnish heritage, <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's not a small tongue. And it needs a bit of real estate to, you know, stay out of the airway. So, you know, like me being a couple years ago when I was having these problems, you know, I was 10% body fat, you know, pretty pretty lean I did have a pretty pretty big neck like you know because of um, ton of lifting but like the there the problem was more so the shape of the face and the shape of the, the anatomical structures like you were saying that was predisposing me to having this problem yeah 
Yeah, and I mean, there's I think there's four, uh, maybe about four or five different phenotypes really in terms of like what can be the cause of it, and it ranges from anatomical to how people breathe. Uh, and their, their CO2 tolerance, chemosensitivity, chemosensitivity to CO2, that sort of thing, which is, I guess, a big part of what I try to look at now, just because my ability to work with people in the space of with, with their breath and like with someone like yourself, where, yeah, the tongue might have been playing an issue, but there also might have been some breathing things that you could improve as well. Whereas if you've got someone who's having 30, 40, 50, 150, apneas an hour then you're going to need CPAP initially anyway because you just not uh, they just don't have the the energy or the, the 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 enthusiasm to be able to do anything other than just sleep so you want to get them sleep and get them energy back first and get them into a space where they're feeling good to then change their behaviors and things and habits 100 percent, and that's a good segue could you please um walk us down the path of like okay someone shows up and they're you know, having these problems, like how, what would be the, the sort of the order of importance? Like, where do you start? What's what's the least invasive, and then maybe, walk us down the path of like to the more invasive um, solutions that one could have for a sleep disordered breathing problem. Yeah, so I mean, if it's if we're going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea, because sleep disordered breathing is a is an umbrella category for central sleep apnea and obesity hyperventilation as well, which are different. Um, uh, different causes for those and different treatments but obstructive sleep apnea it really does depend on the severity so if you're having from you know, 5 to 15 apneas an hour um, compared to 15 to 30 or above 30 it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary on, on what route you might take and also the severity of the symptoms as well so, like you said, you only had five apneas an hour, but you, you, know, you notice severe issues. Now, with you, that's probably because you've got a healthy nervous system. So if every time you had an apnea, your nervous system picks it up early, so it disturbed your sleep. But if you've got a 65-year-old you know, lady where her nervous system's not quite as uh, um, sensitive, then they might have six, or six to ten apneas an hour, but still remain asleep because their you know, sympathetic nervous system just didn't kick in as fast as yours would. So it's really looking at the individual as uh, a whole, I guess, and including them in it. But if we were to go on a basic structure, if you were mild, then you might be able to do some breathing retraining. Uh, even if you're mild to moderate, then you might be able to do things as, such as uh, getting into people to a point where you're checking they've got a functional breathing pattern first, then looking at improving their tolerance to carbon dioxide, and then looking at things like taping the mouth so they can breathe through the nose uh, at night time so looking Absolutely. at their breathing at rest looking at their breathing at rest and during the day and then looking that's going to transfer over to how they breathe at night time uh, could you please could I just stop you there could you yeah, could you please go on. over what's um, functional functional breathing and why is the tolerance to carbon dioxide uh, really really why is it important and why is building your tolerance to carbon dioxide a very powerful strategy to start improving your breathing patterns yeah, okay, so if, so the, fun, the, the term functional dis dysfunctional just means that there's either a problem or, or, or you know, you're, you're breathing efficiently. And dysfunctional breathing uh, can be categorized into, again, there may be three or four for different things. But typically, if we're looking at someone who's stressed or might have sleep apnea, it means they're probably breathing through their mouth rather than their nose. And we know that just from looking at how the, the, the SME is built between the two, is that we have teeth in our mouth, we don't have teeth in our nose. We have turbinates and we have sinuses up our nose, we don't have those in our mouth. So it just makes sense that we should be breathing through one and eating through the other. Yet we're not taught that. And in fact, we're probably taught the opposite, especially during exercise, is that you know, you've got to ventilate, you've got to breathe through your mouth. And yeah, you know, it, it makes sense. Oh, if you, the more you breathe, the, the more air you're going to get in, but the more oxygen you get in, but it's not. It's, there's a limited amount of space within your lungs that you can do, um, and we can go down that avenue of want, but that was going to go off a little bit topic. But dysfunctional breathing, and especially from a, a, a state of stress, is basically someone's breathing through their mouth because they want to breathe faster, because they're in a state where carbon dioxide is potentially rising. They're sensitive to it. And what that causes is it usually causes more thoracic dominant breathing. So rather than breathing down into the lower part of the lungs, activating the diaphragm, 
appropriately. When we do breathe, the diaphragm should flatten out, the rib should pull out pu outwards 360 degrees. Whereas in dysfunctional breathing, it's upwards breathing. A lot of using the uh, trapezius and the sternocleidomastoids, and it's, it's more of that. Now, that's just inefficient, it's tiring, but also when that happens at night time as well, is you have less resistance when you breathe through the mouth. And when you breathe through the mouth uh, at night, you're then gonna, yeah, your jaw's also gonna likely to drop back, your tongue's likely to drop back, and it's likely to then cause the occlusion. So that's one of the reasons why the actual, I guess, the, the mechanic of breathing can cause uh, sleep apnea. But then we got the, the, the biochemical aspect, which is the carbon dioxide tolerance. We have chemoreceptors in our carotid bodies and our uh, brainstem, which are detecting levels of carbon dioxide and blood acidity pH. Now, carbon dioxide is our main driver to breathe. When we when we are stressed or when we put ourselves in stress, such as exercise, we have a breakdown of our of our uh, uh, no, glucose into ox into uh, creating and oxygen creating carbon dioxide and H two O. Now CO two then causes to breathe more. However, people with a dysfunctional breathing pattern tend to over and over ventilate. They ventilate more than they need to, and they ventilate out of their mouth, which then tends to blow off more carbon dioxide than they need to. So they have might have a intermittently have a lower level of CO2 in their body, which then the receptors don't get exposed to it as much. And if receptors work, basically, on the more they're exposed, the less sensitive they are. Uh, the, the only example I can really ever think of is that uh, when people take anabolic steroids, is that the, the more they take, the more they have to take because their receptors get dimmed down because they just get bluntened. It's the same with CO2. Now, if you have less in your body, then the receptors become more sensitive to those changes. So then all of a sudden you put yourself into a stress state or a state of exercise, you breathe more. You breathe faster, but also in the brain stem itself, uh, sorry, not in the brain stem, the amygdala, there's sensors in there that are checking for levels of CO2. And then as that level of CO2 rises, it causes the innate panic alarm, which is the suffocation alarm, because CO2 is our also driver to breathe. So then people get more likely to get anxious tendencies and more likely to get woken up during sleep because CO2 is rising, it arouses their brain. Again, the pre complex, which is the part of the brain which causes us to breathe, and all of a sudden causes facet breathing, which causes people to wake up. So there's a, you know, a lot of elements that to, to take away there in terms of what the CO2 is. But if we can build a tolerance through that, through breath hold work, through exposure to CO2, through exercise, through uh, nasal breathing, a combination of those things, then we can suppress our need to breathe by having an, a tolerance to it. So we breathe less, we breathe more smooth, we breathe more efficiently, and therefore we don't get waking up as much. And we That's have more energy and more focused and less stressed. I, I, exactly. And every, every aspect of your health is, is enhanced because you're not in mm. a constant state of stress. And that's incredible to me. It was quite incredible to me to learn about this f in the beginning. It's like, so you're saying that just the way that I breathe every single day, because most of our breathing is, is largely unconscious and is driven by this chemoreceptor sensitivity, right? So if, if I'm, my sensitivity to carbon dioxide is very high, if I can tolerate very little carbon dioxide, just that is going to kick on this cascade of events that's going in through my body, that's going to impact the way I think, that's going to impact the way that I perceive the world, that's going to impact the way that every single cell of my body, in, inside my body, mm. operates and the, the overall state of the system. So yeah, yeah. Y but it changes the way your nervous system responds. And as a... Yeah, we could we could go down a rabbit hole of, of of how that causes. If you've got all of a sudden you've got a, a heightened level of uh, an increased level of ventilation, you know, when we get stressed, our brain sending signals to our diaphragm to contract faster because we need to get more air in, we need to get more carbon dioxide out. But then all of a sudden, if we have a condition to a higher level of of, of a faster level of breathing, that's sending signals back up our vagus nerve to our brain to tell us that we're in a heightened alert state. So it's a bi-directional relationship. So if we're breathing fast, 
and we're sending signals to our brain, there's a concept called neuroception, which is actually uh, how our body is, in how our brain is interpreting how our body feels. And if, if our body is sending signals, such as increased heart rate, increased breath rate, and less digestion because of activation of the sympathetic nervous system and less activation of the vagus nerve, it's sending signals to the brain that we're in a, a state of alertness. So our perception seeks out for more threatening, our threat protection systems on. It's constantly, unconsciously seeking out for more. That's where you know, we get stuck in anxiety. Anxiety is the fear that something might happen. It's because unconsciously we're looking for things within our perception that might cause us harm. And then we get conditioned to that. And then we get conditioned to the feeling in our body that that's occurring. And all of a sudden, whenever we breathe faster, that causes anxiety or causes the thoughts of anxiety because we become conditioned through classical conditioning, such as Maslow, uh, no, sorry, what's his, what's his name's dog? Um, Pablo. What's the dog? Pavlov's dog. No, it's, pa it's, it's Pavlo Pavlov's conditioning. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's terrifying sometimes that, um, you know, the fish, f the saying the fish is the last one to realize the existence of water. You're just swimming. You're just, you're just always swimming. And then one day you go and, you know, someone picks you up out of the water. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, I've been swimming there my whole, my whole time. Like, mm, it's much easier. Well, for fish, it's harder to breathe up here. But as a humans, it's, mu it's much easier to breathe above the surface. So, you know, like then, sure. once you've been, almost like once you've been above the surface and you've kind of got a taste of like, oh, okay, wait a minute. That's, that's, that what I thought was normal. That's definitely not normal. Then then you kind of have a, have a point of reference to, to work from. 100%. And I think uh, my own personal story backs that up a fair bit. And I talked about this on a, on a clip that I put on YouTube about how nasal breathing can actually help with anxiety. And the, I mean, I was a respiratory scientist for six or seven years until I actually started to pay attention to my own breathing. And it was only through doing uh, haven't been recommended to do ROMWAD, doing uh, no range of motion workout daily. Uh, but have you heard of that? Say, no, um, no, I haven't. Uh, it's basically like a, a, a marketed towards cross, CrossFit athletes as a form of like yoga, but it's really very slow and meditative, and you slow. It's, it's yin yoga, but with very slow breathing. And uh, when I started to practice that daily, and I started to pay attention to, I was trying to improve my hip mobility, but then started paying attention to my breath. All of a sudden I started to get into like a real slow state and started to realize that I have so much going on in my mind. I was like, holy crap. Uh, at the time I was very anxious because I'd gone through an emotionally abusive relationship, but all my focus was on never being able to get a girlfriend, being so concerned that women are evil. Uh, and my focus was all over here, but when I started to slow my breathing down and do meditations, like, I realized that I had this whole low level of anxiety my whole life about all these things that were going on through my head, about work, about my future, about where, where I am in my life, about not feeling good, like, that I wasn't even aware of, because, like you say, it's not until you, you pull the fish out of the water that you realize there's so much going on, and there's, it's like, okay, wow, oh, you know, you, it's like that aha moment, and then, you, then that's, that was the reference point for me. And, the, and then you started, you know, applying your, th that was when you were still a, a researcher, or? Uh, no, so I'd st I've been doing clinical work, but the, the, the most of the clinical work that I'm doing was actually looking at the lungs themselves and how they function. And then I started going down the avenue of actually, okay, uh, how, how do we breathe? And how, do, how much impact does that have on, us, on our psychology and my own psychology? And that went down a rabbit hole of uh, finding, discovering all this and, you know, it, it, from the background that I had, it, it was able to, I was able to f look at it physiologically very, uh, quite easily. Yeah. Or enjoyably, shall I say. Yeah, I, I bet. Yeah, so some really interesting takeaways here is like, you know, like on, on one hand, we've spoken about the carbon dioxide and how that's really important for our everyday breathing. And, you know, the breath is, it is this, it's not only it's a tool to directly influence the, the state of the whole system and sort of like put on the brakes and because because when you focused on your breathing and you focused on your body you're you can't you can't think of anything else you can't think of that you know what you're just mentioning about the women being evil and 
and whatever that may be. But for other people, it may be the you know the meeting or the the deadline. And for for myself, you know, I have plenty of stuff going on. Sometimes I'm thinking about my clients or whatever, and it's like the the thing that's the most. I have a few tools. I go to the sauna. I I do a few things in my life to sort of try to manage my stress levels. But the especially the breath practice, especially with air hunger, so the carbon dioxide tolerance training through breath holding or through just, you know, consciously minimizing my breathing and experiencing that little bit of an uncomfortable state of air hunger, that is by far the most powerful and the most potent way to just stop and just come into the body and just become very, very present with the, with the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think I've I talk about focus a lot, and uh, a lot of the things that I do with my clients is I'm actually improving their energy, their focus, and their productivity, and that's what's helping with their high performance. But it's coming from a health base, and not just their ability to focus and pay attention and do their work, but where they're actually shifting their focus. You know, people who are stressed and they're anxious are often putting their focus on the stress and the anxious things they're they're concerned about. And that's not the result they want to get. That's their psychological tension pulling them away from the result they want to get. So then all of a sudden they, they, their behaviors drift towards seeking out the stuff they don't like. But whereas if you can shift that through breathing, through allowing yourself to repattern how you breathe, slowing yourself down, and also sitting with that tension of, okay, I'm feeling anxious, okay, can I just breathe through this and retrain that conditioning? Okay, can you sh- then you put yourself into an uncomfortable position but are you able to focus on what it is the end result you actually truly want and what you want to do with your life and where you want to go and the goals you want to achieve that's 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 also the 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 benefit of being able to utilize a, a tool that's the breath is being able to use it as a modulator to shift your focus yeah because that's shifting your focus and that modulator that's um it's a like you said it's a it's a skill that you can once you've got that skill now you can apply it in many many different areas areas of your life yeah i I always people when i have a new client start with me and i one of the um, i'm really big on you know improving their aerobic fitness in the beginning because you kind of have to have a level of aerobic fitness before we can even stop worrying about you know building the most amount of muscle mass because if you can't tolerate any training volume then we really yeah. don't have anywhere to go. So we have to really work on the whole cardiorespiratory system. But, you know, in the beginning, usually in the first session, in the end of the session, I'll put them on the air bike and I'll tell them, okay, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to do every minute on the minute, we'll do 15 seconds and we're only going to be breathing through our nose. You're not going to open your mouth at all during this next 10 minutes. And then they, they start going and usually like most people, after a couple of rounds, they start looking around. Oh, are you serious? Like, they start trying to be like that. Uh, no, no, keep the lips together. And it's people don't even know that there's kind of this place to stand on where you can control your response to, to stress in the, in the moment. And uh, controlling your breath in a stressful environment, such as when you are exercising, then that's a really, really good place to start cultivating that that. St- you know that skill of being able to take that stand and control your response to circumstances yeah because it allows you when you can focus on the breath and you can stay calm during the exercise yes like uh, a lot of people are not going to be able to do that straight away right? and, and uh, the whole point of you doing that is to challenge the system but it's also then to challenge their belief systems as well it's also okay well what story do you start to tell yourself when it gets hard do you say you can't do this because that's all a story because at the end of 10 minutes, when they finished it, and you go to them, why did you manage to do or do it? Uh, what did, but what story did you tell yourself at three minutes, four minutes? What impact did that have on your physiology? What did you start to do? Did you start to panic, worry? Did you start to slow down? Like that's, that's the, you know, the, the level of performance. It's like where was your focus going? Was your focus going towards not being able to do it? Or was your focus going towards, I'm gonna get past this next minute, and then the next mm-hmm. minute? And that's what it. And that's what drives people's you know, pulling their attention away to a negative versus a positive. It causes avoidance behavior versus a, you know, a, a rewarding behavior. And I, and I imagine that is that that as well is that's something that you can train, right? 
like the it's, it's, what, it's what you can train and it's transferable it's it's transferable to in back into the office and back into the into the business room it's it's just awareness it's purely awareness awareness and and almost like every time you do that every time you sort of you're like no I'm, 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 I'm gonna focus I can do this every time you do that it's like you just did a rep and you just put a rep in the tank yeah. And sort of like every time you do a repetition, that way of doing things, that way of thinking, that becomes stronger and it becomes easier and easier to tap into that. And that old pattern of thinking becomes weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. I, uh, for the first time, I think almost ever did a maximum breath hold myself maybe two weeks ago. And I did, I did it and I did... Uh, Three minutes fifty-seven the first time, and then I was like, "Oh, I did not expect to get that." And then the second time I did it, I got four minutes fifty-seven, so nearly a five-minute breath hold. And the only thing that got me there was just not listening to the story that I needed to breathe, ignoring it, telling yourself you're okay. You're laying on your bed. What's the worst that can happen? You pass out. You wake up. That is the worst that can happen. Keep going. Keep holding. Keep holding. Keep holding. And it's just m your mind can override. If you look at you know, Goggins' story and uh, you know, what, you know, how the way David Goggins and how he talks to himself, it's, we're only at 30 or 40% of our capacity because we, t we start to tell our story. We start to tell our story to, you know, to make ourselves feel safe and, and stuck. Exactly. And the longer you've been telling yourself the same story, chances are that you're going to start believing it too. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm curious, with the, with the breath hold, how did you do it? Was it um, you know, after an inhalation? And then from there, or was it after yeah. an exhalation? Uh, so, uh, so I did. No, it was an exhalation. I won't be able to do that long. <laughs> yeah, I was like, um, that's an impressive bolt score you've got there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I did um, maybe three to four minutes of just slow, steady nasal breathing, just and like a, in my mind, just doing a progressive muscle relaxation, just go like a bit of a quick NSDR, deep breath protocol, just going from my toes up to my body to make sure everything was relaxed as possible, not moving. Then I emptied my lungs, took a big breath as full as I can and held it and just kept holding. And I think after about a minute 30, I started getting contractions and the contractions got faster and faster and faster. And you can just feel like your whole body just wants to just know, just contract. But if you just try in your mind, just say, don't move. Wow. even even re relax into those muscles relax into your diaphragm as much as you can and when you when you start telling yourself you need to breathe ignore it as for as long as you can <laughs> that's fascinating um, I might have to give that a shot <laughs> um, Martin what would your recommendation be you know someone's listening to this they want to start you know they want some actionable takeaways of this how can they start what would be your recommendation? Where to get started with starting to improve your breathing patterns, starting to improve your carbon dioxide tolerance, which should then transfer to all the things that we've spoke about, sleep quality, focus, performance? Uh, so the first thing is making sure that at rest during the day is that you're nasal breathing. Even sat at a desk, you, know, you just... Um, just ensure that you are breathing through your nose as much as possible. And if you struggle to breathe through your nose, then maybe just doing some short exhale breath holds, just trying to clear your nostrils as possible, or seeking out help to try and get some way to improve your uh, nasal development capacity. Then, um, yeah, it would just be during exercise, starting at low intensity exercise, like you like you do with your with your clients. Just maybe just going for a walk and seeing. Okay, well, what pace can you start to? build yourself up to with your mouth closed maybe putting some water in your mouth just to keep it in there just to, as a bit of a, a tool to uh, keep yourself accountable sure you are breathing through your nose yeah yeah uh, and, and and start to build it that way and th and then I guess uh, an easy one that to take away is once you finish your exercises exercise routine or your, your, your gym session at the very end is like okay well how easily can you then get yourself back down from a stress state to a low stress state? And can you maybe do some box breathing starting at three seconds in, three second hold, three seconds out, three second hold? Can you work up over maybe six or seven weeks to be able to, at the end of your um, gym session, how far can you start to expand that out to? The way I like to use CO2 is, is that if we're doing high intensity exercise, 
there's going to be an excess post-oxygen consumption at the very end of our training. And that means CO2 is going to continue to rise for a while because we're going to have to re -ex no, re re resupply that, that, uh, that, um, that fuel. And that fuel has got to be put into our bodies for oxygen, so we're going to get CO2 levels rising. So utilizing that ten, 5 to 10 minute window after a high intensity exercise while CO2 is still rising to try and then take conscious control and use the air hunger then. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. That's another thing that I do. People are, why do I have to do this five minutes of diaphragmatic breathing, breathing after my session? I gotta go. I'm like, no, no, like this is important. <laughs> I'm gonna lie down, yeah. and you're gonna try to sit with it, and like developing the. It, would that be related to your? I'm always been thinking about this. Would that be related to your heart rate variability? Like, how quickly can you go from a state of being in extreme arousal, you know, during your training session? How quickly can you flip the switch and tune things all the way down? Is that, would that be related, that w do, would you imagine that yeah. that would correlate with your heart rate variability? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's, there's dynamics of it. Again, we, you know, you've got the, the biomechanical aspects, your ability to actually just how you control your breathing, you know, you've got the, the CO2 level, but then also, yeah, the third aspect of it is going to be related to your heart rate variability and your ability to tap into your, parasympathetic nervous system and switch from one to the other which you know, people term the word stress resilience nowadays uh, so yeah that's a that's a way to to do that and also there's a there's a psychophysiological dynamic as well because if you're trying to get someone to do uh, I call it control work following high intensity exercise then you've got to be aware of the story you're telling yourself again to try and stay relaxed in the mind so you can slow the breath down and take control so there's a there's an added component to it there as well as the co2 tolerance I love that you, you keep bringing up the, the psychological aspect. This is definitely is something that I haven't thought about um, as much, but that's that's absolutely great. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I look, I'm fascinated with both psychology and physiology, and I don't think you can have one without the other. And I think we're st the further we look into the science of physiology, we're realizing that psychology has misunderstood physiology at the same time. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So, Martin, to bit of a to a bit of a wrap up, and this is the wellness and high performance podcast. And in that theme, I always like to ask people the same question in the end of the program. So, Martin, what is your single most impactful habit, high impact habit in your life that you do right now, that you think that is absolutely essential for your own well being, and it really allows you to perform at your best, both mentally and physically. Uh, my whole life, I mean, for 18 years now, I've trained. And if I don't train, then I feel terrible mentally, physically. Um, and that's not just you know, going to the gym and just doing weights. As I, I include the, the breathing, how I'm breathing, uh, my ex actual strength exercise, my conditioning, and my recovery, in, including in, in that session. So you know, I've got, not only am I getting aerobic or anaerobic training in there, I'm getting strength training in there, also, I'm getting stress, stress, stress resilience training in there, and also I'm mindful of my breathing, which then transfers across into my whole life. So, I've just had five days off because I've been away diving, and I couldn't wait to get back because I just started to feel mentally just terrible. So, it's just a habit, it's a part of who I am. And uh, uh, my partner thinks I'm obsessed, even though I only go four times a week. There's people who are worse, but it's just, I just think if you. That's for me is the one habit that I have. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you very much. Martin, can you please tell the listener how they can learn more about you and how they can find you online? Yeah, sure. So um, Performance Through Health is my business and I'm pretty much all over social media is how people can find me. And then uh, my website is www.performancethroughhealth.com. And also, um, I've got some free video training as well that people can learn more about training, uh, how to reduce their stress and boost their focus, energy, and productivity. And I'll send you the link for that to, to pop that down into the, into the show notes and when you put that out so people can check that out as well. Fantastic. I'll definitely do that. Do that. Thank, you th thank you so much for coming on, Martin. And no worries. Uh, thank you for the invite. It's been an absolute pleasure. It, uh, no worries. Thanks, Coach. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to do this again. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to. Take it easy.